Welcome to the Member Speaker Series. Today is a very special homecoming for all of us. What a pleasure it is to be with you. Our members, nearly 43,000 households strong, are the backbone of the garden. We appreciate your unwavering support. I'm David Kemper, a longtime trustee of 33 years to the garden and a past chair of the board of the trustees. More important this evening, however, than my official capacity with the garden is my decades-long relationship with Peter Raven. I've been among the fortunate to have worked with Peter over the many years of his many, many accomplishments. Peter's truly a Renaissance man, a brilliant, passionate, and infinitely curious person. My favorite description of Peter is he's a combination of Socrates and Barnum and Bailey. Peter took his position as a renowned botanist to be one of the first modern day champions of the environment and sustainability. And in doing this, made the Missouri Botanical Garden one of the preeminent global research gardens. He has always been curious about everything in nature. He has friends, not just famous colleagues, but friends on every continent. Peter makes his very erudite research relevant to every one of us. He has always been not only approachable, but eager to bring us all under a large and inclusive tent for a better planet. Thus, it's a special pleasure tonight to welcome Peter back. We're excited to be among the first to hear about his book, Driven by Nature. This book is a culmination of Peter's life work. And we at the Garden are so pleased that we have been witness to many of what is on these pages. We will hear a wide-ranging conversation as my friend, Washington University's Dr. Barbara Shaw, engages Peter and gives us the behind-the-scenes story of the book. Dr. Shaw is a luminary in her own right. She's been the president of the Botanical Society of America, as well as the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She's an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Science and the United States National Academy of Sciences. She was a member of President Obama's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology. In 2004, she received the Wilbur Cross Medal from Yale University. In 2019, she received the National Science Board's Public Service Medal. From 2013 to 2020, she served as Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Science and is currently the Mary Dell Chilton Prof Distinguished Professor at Washington University. How fortunate we are to be able to listen to both Peter and Barbara. Barbara, the program is yours. Thank you, David, for those very kind remarks. Um, this really is a, a pleasure to participate in uh, today's event for me. You're in for a real treat, and that is we're going to have an interesting and an engaging conversation with uh, Peter H. Raven, the Director Emeritus of the Missouri Botanical Garden. And I know so many of you know Peter and are really looking forward to his remarks. Uh, just a note on where we are. We're in the Peter H. Raven Library at the Missouri Botanical Garden. Um, and behind us are a lot of books from the Missouri Botanical Garden Press. And their most recent um, publication is Driven by Nature, the autobiography of Peter Raven. And this is, I know many of you have read it, many of you want to read it. It's available in the bookshop. So today's program, we're going to be looking at uh, the contributions of Peter Raven and his opinion on a lot of different things. So first, it, we'll look at some of his early years, then we'll have a lot of time to talk about the Missouri Botanical Garden, and then also going on to his international global work as a leading citizen for looking at conservation, conservation of plants and animals, and also sustainability. You have the opportunity to um, ask questions of Peter. You can use the question and answer function, and we will collect some of those and hopefully get to as many as possible. So with that, I know we all want to hear from Peter. And so we'll start first with just a couple of remarks from Peter. And then I have um, a series of, of issues that I think we're all interested in hearing about. So Peter, turning it to you. Well, David and you speaking at the beginning of the remarks today provide a perfect opportunity to say that in no place could my career have developed as beautifully as it has in St. Louis with the support of so many people the garden is a gem of an institution on a world scale. And for people in St. Louis to have had the foresight to have supported it for so long is truly remarkable. They've seen its potential. They've helped to bring it up to its potential and they've firmly placed it among the many outstanding institutions in St. Louis and on a global scale as well. And it's been a true pleasure I came here 50 years ago when I was 35 years old, and it's been a very wonderful 50 years. Don't think it could have been better anywhere else. Thanks. So you came here um, uh, 
a while ago, um, <laughs> but you've been a, a botanist for an extraordinarily long time. Uh, from from your, reading your autobiography, one of the things to me that is so remarkable is that you showed an interest in biology very early on, a really deep passion for nature. And obviously, this has not abated um, across your whole career. How did your love of nature um, start and how did it emerge and how was it fostered in those very young years? Well, I think most kids are interested in the insects and little animals and snakes and things they see around them. The home where I grew up in my formative years was in the, was, uh, in the western part of the city of San Francisco, built on the sand dunes and with a lot of the native animals and plants still there all around where we were. Uh, in looking at them, I was uh, interested, but what really drove me to a deeper interest was my mother finding a book for me called uh, Six Legs, and uh, it was all about insects, and I said, my word, are they really doing all those wonderful things like cabbage butterflies and larvae and then pupae and then an adult butterfly? I mean, that became too good to be true, but what was of telling importance was the fact that the California Academy of Sciences, a, a wonderful uh, museum that was founded in 1853 in San Francisco, was right there with a terrific opportunity for kids to come in and learn about nature and depending on which way their interests went to take part in activities in some of the various, uh, in some of the various departments of the Cal Academy and that was totally formative for me. I stayed with them until I was a sophomore in college. I started there at eight years old. Uh, and uh, pretty quickly after that, they changed the entrance age to 12. <laughs> <laughs> I won't draw any conclusions from that, but you certainly may. <laughs> So, so one of the things that um, I think is interesting is not only did you develop this deep passion very early, but there were a whole series of people that mentored you. And in, in the autobiography, it's just amazing how at a very early age, you bumped into some of the, the, the titans, the icons of, of plant biology. So I wonder if you could talk about some of those individuals. Sure. Well, uh, at, the, at the California Academy of Sciences, Alice Eastwood, the famous botanist whose career goes all the way from the 1890s to the 1950s, was the head of the department, an inspirational figure. And uh, Tom Howell was her understudy there. And they took me in and let me work with the collections at the academy in various ways as a volunteer. Tom, I, I said that to Tom later, that it was so much fun to be able to do that, to be a volunteer. And he said, well, you forgot the bait. And I said, what was the bait? And he said, I used to put a candy bar in the drawer below where you were to come in and be a volunteer and you would eat it. <laughs> so I like that. I was a very lanky kid at that time. One of the most exciting adventures that I had was when I was 14 years old. Um, Tom Howell had uh, been exploring with the Sierra Club on successive outings what the plants of the high Sierra were like, the mountain range that divides California from the Great Basin and from Nevada above Timberline. And they were poorly known when he got into that in the 1940s. And in 1950, they were having the base camp at another place and he, he couldn't go. Bishop Creek uh, above Bishop in the Owens Valley on the east side of the Sierra. And he asked if I would go and collect plants. Imagine a 14 year old being asked to go and collect plants to fix whatever plants there were in that part of the Sierra. Well, the truly remarkable thing was that was post-war and there were fewer cars and people generally shared rides and all. So shared rides and um, they said, well, call up this man. I was 14 years old and uh, arrange to meet them in Berkeley, you know, and they'll, they'll drive you. And I said, uh, so I called and talking to him and I said, uh, well, I, 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 want, I want to bring some plant presses, some, some slatted uh, containers that you can press plants in and make herbarium specimens out of. And uh, I wonder if they'll fit in the trunk of your car. And do you, can you imagine what they're like? He said, oh, yes, I can. And it turned out that that man was Ledger Stebbins, <laughs> the most famous evolutionary botanist of the, of the 20th century. 
And he became a great friend of that, of me from that time when I was 14 years old uh, until his death in 1999, right after the Botanical Congress in St. Louis. What an extraordinary consequence it was to meet up with him just on the verge of his moving to Davis to start a genetics department there, and just on the verge of his great book, Variation and Evolution in Plants, coming out. Almost unbelievable. It, it is truly remarkable. Um, those of us that are plant scientists, it's, it's just incredible that as a 14-year-old, you hooked <laughs> up with Stevens. Um, so that was a really a remarkable um, youth. But then, of course, you became a professional scientist, and you've had a number of different experiences. Um, you've been affiliated with several institutions, and as your career as a scientist developed, in particular, you note that there was a strong influence of Stanford and then also a very seminal um, experience when you went to New Zealand, I believe, as a sabbatical. And I wonder if you could talk about how those institutions and how the sabbatical in New Zealand influenced you as a, a, a botanical scientist. And also, um, was this the beginning of your interest in global sustainability and conservation? Well, it's interesting. When I was... Um a college undergraduate student, which was uh, first two years at the University of San Francisco, and then the last two years at Berkeley, I didn't really understand that you could have a career in this kind of thing at all. I didn't understand that you could be paid to be a professional student of variation and so forth in plants. And uh, we didn't have a lot of money, so I didn't know what, I thought I would get my undergraduate degree and probably teach high school or something. But Ledyard Stebbins came back into the picture and made it clear that you could, uh, if you got into graduate school in fields like that, you would be supported financially, and then that made it physically possible. I think that we've made a real mistake in allowing higher education to become so desperately expensive nowadays that only a few people can afford it. And I hope to heavens that we'll have the good sense to know that an educated public is the most important asset that we can leave for future generations. Uh, by the, so by the time I was in the upper division at Berkeley, I began to pursue, uh, I began to understand that I could do that and began to think in terms of being a professional. Uh, Lincoln Constance, one of the botanists there, was very, very helpful to me. But I ran into Harlan Lewis and his wife, Margaret, who was also a botanist, who were in the growing, the fairly new botany department at UCLA. Uh, UCLA now is a very in the top two or three public universities, but then it wasn't at that rate. But my friendship with Harlan and my finding plants that were of interest to them, Harlan and Margaret, they grew them. Uh, and then invited me to come down in 56 between my junior and senior years at Berkeley and work with them and see what the hybrids were like and determine the status of these plants that I'd found. And that was a great experience and, of course, led me to apply to graduate school there, which I attended from 1957 to 1960. Uh, then I went on a... Um, uh, postdoctoral funded by the National Science Foundation at the British Museum in London and began to look at my group of plants, the Evening Primrose family, beyond California. Before that, it all been what's going on in California and what can I find out about the plants there? And then suddenly it began to open up to, well, what's all around? And I found my way to Stanford and uh, there, cross paths with Paul Ehrlich and Dick Holm and uh, other colleagues with whom I had a very successful scientific uh, uh, relationship during the next nine years when I was at Stanford. Uh, Paul and I studying the relationship between butterflies and the, pl and the plants that their larvae, their caterpillars fed on discovered a very interesting systematic relationship that we called coevolution, which turns out to have sparked, uh, oh, I think there are thousands of papers with theme coevolution in them since then. And it was a, 
a seminal idea and it was really possible to do that. It's interesting though, because so many people were rearing butterflies and paying attention to them and all that they had a good idea of what their larvae were eating. Now the sixties were a very rough time psychologically. I mean, some of us look on the last years as rough, but the sixties were about as jumbled as you can imagine. And uh, I was getting pretty confused about where I was going. Uh, my first wife died in 1968 uh, uh, when I was at Stanford. And I went on sabbatical to New Zealand to see what I could find there and kind of, re well, I didn't realize it, but I think subconsciously I was trying to reset the clock and had a really wonderful year in New Zealand and Australia and then five months coming back across Eurasia. The fact that I was studying a group of plants, willow weeds, epilobium, at, in New Zealand, which were a group that I knew in North America, and beginning to think about the patterns you know, that linked them was very important formatively because it, it sort of opened a global perspective. And what was really important was that was the same time that the idea of a continental movement became in, uh, uh, generally proposed in the 1920s, but a lot of people had said, well, that's ridiculous, but it became accepted. And when I began to apply that to epilobium and to other plants, then I began to see patterns on a global scale <clears throat> and I could never look back. So that, that has, I think was really formative and it gave you incredible mm -hmm. um, uh, credentials and a tr tremendous um, stature as, as a scientist. Then um, the Missouri Botanical Garden came to call. And this is something that many of us that know Peter and know the Botanical Garden are really quite amazed at. Given that you had a little or no administrative experience as a faculty member at Stanford, and that you hadn't supervised any staff members, uh, graduate students, of course you had, the uh, Missouri Botanical Garden trustees offered you the position. And this was one of the most bold, um, prescient, and ultimately spectacular kinds of uh, decisions that somebody could make. So I think many of us are curious, what were the factors that led you to apply and to accept the position? And do you have any idea how the board of trustees made this decision, um, which turned out on paper, not particularly an obvious decision. I'm putting that mildly. Well, it's probably stupidity on my part <laughs> and a dumb faith in the fact that day, by working day to day, <clears throat> I could figure it out. Um, I had a strong feeling for the ability of other people to do things and to accomplish things. Uh, the people of St. Louis, particularly at that point, Tom Smith and Howard Bear on the board of trustees were extraordinarily supportive and others like Warren Shapley and Hal Wurtenbacher and, and uh, many others. And their support really led me to uh, take the right steps. Now, for me, it was a, for both of us, for both parties, for me and for the uh, Missouri Botanical Garden, I think it was a real plunge. I mean, why would you hire someone to be in charge of the garden, which is even then as much smaller than it is now was a complex institution involving a, a research, a beautiful display garden and a, a um, serious program of uh, research into plants who had no experience. I don't know. I think in retrospect that the people of St. Louis uh, were ready to support who came in, you know, properly. Dave Gates, who was a biophysicist who came in six years earlier, had begun to pull the garden out of the doldrums. The completion of the Climatron in 1960 was very important. It was the second largest geodesic dome that had been built up to that point and got publicity in Life magazine and all. Walter Lewis, who came just before a year or two before Gates, in the research department was a tremendous positive influence in building the, putting the publication program back in line. But um, it's true that the garden program was not very international at that point, even though 
specimens that would have allowed it to be international and books that would have allowed it to be library were present here in abundance where they weren't here other places. So when I came here, <clears throat> I saw those assets. What I fervently realized was that the garden was there because of the people of St. Louis, because of many of you who are listening and the thousands of people that you represent, and that if it was interesting to the people of St. Louis and worthwhile, they would support it as, as they have, as, as you do with many other cultural institutions. And that turned out to be the case. So I started by really putting all of my efforts into making an interesting place. Uh, soon developing a master plan and thinking about other gardens and other activities and so forth. And uh, let the idea of the research and educational program sort of follow along with that. So maybe um, we could turn to your impressions of the garden. What was it like when you arrived? What did it look like? And um, ultimately, how did you develop um, both simultaneously the cultural and the, um, the cultural aspects of the garden, which is a tremendous cultural institution in St. Louis, and also this international scientific, I mean, uh, program. And so there is a huge amount of very rapid development um, but what, what was his foundations? What was yeah. the start? What did it look like here? Yeah, well, the only part of the garden that was really a garden in those days was the part between Tower Grove House and the Linnean House. In other words, down the main axis of the garden. And it's, it's hard to believe, but people coming to work uh, in the administration building, which is the all brick building across from the layman building, people coming to work there would drive up a dirt road from where the maintenance center is now diagonally right across what's now the garden, but was outside of the garden then up to a parking lot uh, that, that was in the area, a just dirt parking lot in the area uh, um, north of the uh, administration building and park there on a dirt parking lot, walk into the administration building or the museum and go to work. So I'd say about a third of the area that we consider garden now was cultivated. There was a, a wall going across, uh, sticking out from the Leanne house and going from wall to wall in the garden. And the, the whole northern part there was uncultivated and, and the whole uh, western part of the garden too was basically uncultivated. So I think, what are we going to do about this? And then as we got into it, it became more and more obvious that we needed an overall master plan in order to make a good job of it. And we needed that to do things logically and to have them ultimately relate to one another. So um, we proceeded with that. Uh, first, we did a master for the uh, fountains in the, in the area, which was interesting. If you had the whole area, where could you put fountains? Then uh, we began to look around who can really help us develop a master plan. And we found John Simmons firm environmental planning and design, which was at that point designing the Chicago Botanical Garden, the Cary Arboretum of the New York Botanical Garden, um, some of um, uh, Bill Gates' grounds in Seattle at his house and all, and looked like a place that could really manage it. Whereas in St. Louis, there was nobody at that point who could really think on the scale of a, of a master plan for a botanical garden where all the parts would fit together. They came in. One of the first things that happened was the Japanese garden. Looking at the plan of the garden, the um, EPD, Environmental Planning and Design representatives, Jeff Rausch, uh, Missy Marshall, already visualized greatly enlarging the lake in the uh, southwest corner of the garden into a, the five and a half acre lake that's there now. That, so that was on the plans. At that point, a group of Japanese citizens in St. Louis, mainly people who had been moved here during World War II, came to me and said, well, we have an association here and we planted a few cherry trees in the uh, Forest Park, and we wonder if you'd be interested in a Japanese garden. No, no, not in a Japanese, in planting a few fruit trees 
in the Missouri Botanical Garden. I said, sure. Now, at that time, there were some lanterns from the Japanese Garden in the World's Fair uh, that had been bought by a trustee and were in a small pond garden uh, behind the Climatron, so to speak. And uh, I thought, well, let's enlarge that and build it up. Well, as soon as I told that to the master planners, they did what they were supposed to do. They shrieked, no, no, no. It needs to be a much bigger conception than that. It should go down by the lake uh, that we're developing in the far corner of the garden and be a magnet drawing people in there. And uh, so I thought about it. Okay. We began looking for an architect for the Japanese garden who could really design a we didn't think of it as five and a half as a 14 acre garden, which it really is now. But um, we knew it had to be well thought out with the parts fitting together. And we looked around and we looked around and we found a professor at UCLA named Koichi Kawana, who gave lectures on Japanese philosophy, Japanese garden and all. And the he was located through the Japanese American Citizens League, putting out a call. George Hasegawa, who was a local representative, put out the call, you know, and nationally, who can really do this? And they came and they agreed to do it. Well, to give you an idea of how devoted they were to what we did in uh, what we were doing in St. Louis, um, they charged, uh, Koichi charged us, he had sort of a company with Carol Parrish, $5,000 for the entire first plan of the whole 14 acres. In other words, they were very anxious to make their contribution. Uh, then there was the plan. What do we do about it? Uh, and that's when I really got into fundraising for particular things. Yeah, I think that would be actually uh, interesting to hear how, um, and it's not just the Japanese garden, but there's been subsequent gardens and a huge amount of research activity. So how, and, and you talk in your autobiography that the garden um, budget was, was meager when you came and it's greatly expanded at, as has the number of, me of members. So how, how did you cobble together all of the funding to do this um, tremendous growth of the garden physical plant, and also the research um, activities? Well, for the Japanese garden, we uh, first of all had to enlarge the lake. The whole ridge running down uh, the uh, west side of the garden that uh, shelters the garden from the community was um, built by 70,000 cubic yards of dirt that were pulled out of the lake at that time to make it a really significant lake. And uh, we got that money from the state in a direct appropriation uh, through our local representatives, which were um, Kenny Rothman and, and Richard Rabbit, and they were very active and liked to support that. I think that was $300,000 in those days. Lord knows what it would be now. But that was the, the uh, defining step. And then we got, <laughs> actually, it's, it's fun, the second year we got an appropriation for the renovation of the Japanese garden. At that point, it was a big hole in the ground. We renovated it by polishing it up. Uh, John Elsley, who was on our staff, and Carl Pettit, who came in, played a good hands-on role in getting the garden together. And for example, we had to put individual stones in places at what the water line of the Japanese garden would be. If you think about it, the edge of the garden, you see stones and fences and all. Well, remember, they all had to be placed before the water was let into the, so it was quite a, quite a matter of leveling and so forth. And Koichi used to come out and he would always say, uh, you know, put that rock there. Now in a Japanese, in a Chinese garden, rocks often stand up like that. That's characteristic. In a Japanese garden, traditionally, rocks are buried up to here. So a lot of the rocks you see in the garden are actually like that. You only see the very tippy top of them. Like an iceberg. Exactly. And, um, well, we went on year after year. And then, you know, with the thing running, I began to look for individual contributions to uh, 
make it work. We got a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, which was for X D cubic yards of gravel to use for the gravel gardens there and all. And we were sort of on the way and the trustees stepped up. Many of the trustees stepped forward at that time. And eventually the garden with its island in the middle and all emerged. And of course, it's been a tremendous delight because it's, it's actually, if people name one reason that they come to the garden other than event, it would be the Japanese garden, a place of great solitude and beauty and tradition right in the middle of the city. As, as all of this was going on, of course, the membership numbers were growing. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't just the Japanese garden. There were of the other gardens. Yes. And um, so obviously you needed to have additional support. And, and I remember when I came here, one of the things that was on the, um, on the agenda for the city was the museum um, zoo tax district. And I, yeah. and that became very important. I understand. Well, with the, in my view, very, very unfortunate separation of the city and County, we got to a point in, in, in the 1960s where it was obvious that the, the city, which is where most of the, all the institutions were located, you know, notably first the zoo and the art museum, and the city couldn't provide enough money to support them and the county could. So Howard Bear and Judge McGuire and others created the idea of a um, taxing district on property tax for both the city and the county where funds for it all would come together and as they did come together, uh, they would go uh, right to the, um, the institutions on, on a prorated amount. And the thing was set up so that it wasn't voted on every year. It could be voted on to reject the whole idea of a zoo museum district, but not voted on every year, which means that all the institutions count on it. So in driving up the interest in the garden, driving up the membership from about 1,800 to about 11,000 in that first decade and creating a sense of momentum, we got the garden to a point where it was uh, people would vote for it and uh, try to create. We had to do some serious legal thinking because the garden is private entity. So there's an intermediate public body, the Botanic Garden Subdistrict, that actually receives the money and then considers what the garden is doing and whether to pass it on. That's the only thing you do legally in the state of Missouri with the Constitution. Well, that was voted on and, uh, and uh, passed. And uh, once that was voted on, you know, we had uh, a solid base of support. One of the ways I talk about that is, that money made it possible for the first time to not only hire good people in the mechanical and other areas, but actually pay them enough of a living salary so they'd be able to stay. Most people who work for the garden are very enthusiastic about it because it's a wonderful, good cause. And you can feel like you're doing something helpful for the environment and for the city and everything else. But if the salaries are too low, you still can't starve yourself to death doing that. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> in many ways, I consider um, leading the effort to get into the Zoo Museum District, in which there were many helpers, not notably Bob Highland in the, in the successful run, um, was the most important thing that I actually did here. The budget for the garden is now uh, in the low 40 millions and you get about 11 million from the Zoo Museum District. Well, then, of course, we went about uh, building out other parts of the master plan as we thought we could afford it or have, a, have an effort to do it. Um, one of the things that is, is interesting about the botanical garden, um, and this is something that is a little less visible, I think, for people that, that uh, visit it, is the, the breadth of the international work that it does. A lot of botanical gardens tend to be local um, regional and some, or even just U.S. bounded, but the Missouri Botanical Garden is so unusual in the the scope of its international work. So I wonder if you could talk about how that happened. Well, tradition is that well, botanical gardens were first founded as branches of medical schools because they were demonstrations of the medicines that you could use and uh, testing grounds for medicines and. 
they they've always been associated with universities and to a to a degree and always scholarly. Most of them don't have the resources, the the um, specimens, the herbarium specimens, dried plant specimens to study, and books, libraries, and so forth to allow them to be international. And actually, the garden had acquired a lot of specimens internationally, but its activities had not been particularly international. Um, I came in with a prejudice that if you were going to work in other countries, you needed to have people living there and you needed to cooperate fully and extensively with the people in those countries in order to really get to know the situation, in order to really make a difference, in order to see that other people were trained to do it. Now, the only place outside the U.S. that the garden had ever and was then uh, active on, on a sort of a, a continuing basis was Panama. They had a station in Panama where they gathered live orchid plants and let them be healthy and then shipped them back on steamers to New Orleans and up to St. Louis when they were healthy enough to come. So it gave us kind of a base there, a trailer and a little facility in the canal, what was then the canal zone. And uh, starting there, Bob Woodson, Robert Woodson, who was a joint appointment of Washington University in the garden and curator, head of the Flora of Panama, organized the Flora of Panama on account of all the plants found in Panama. So that gave us a little anchor. And early in my time here, the National Science Foundation was also beginning to fund operations like this. And so since we had just moved this large herbarium, about 2 million specimens from one place to another, and we're reorganizing, we were able to get a grant. And in the early years with that grant money and others, which I talk about in the book, how we got them, I was able to establish positions for Al Gentry, who became one of the leading tropical botanists of that whole era Tom Crowett, who was already here, but we were able to make his position permanent. Garrett Davidson, Peter Goldblatt, and many others. And, it, and uh, I thought, well, it's logical to expand our work down from Panama into South America, becoming active in places where the other institutions that were working in those areas, like Kew Gardens in London and the New York Botanic Garden, were not active, so we could be complementary. So let, let's actually go off on that and, and focus a little bit on, um, you were named by Time Magazine as the hero of the planet. Um, you're one of the um, scientific leaders in the United States, um, working with uh, the National Academy of Sciences and National Geographic Society. Um, you've developed a very um, strong interest and, and a tremendous advocate for plant conservation and, and for sustainability. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that work, um, how that developed and, um, and, and how you were able to emerge as a global leader and actually influence people as opposed to um, some folks who are very passionate, but less effective. Well, um, a lot of it was easy to forget that <clears throat> We really didn't think of climate change or the loss of species generally as a serious problem until the late 1960s. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, like the term biodiversity wasn't even invented until 1970, early 70s. And as we began to look at things, we realized the whole world was changing rapidly. By building the garden, <clears throat> I was able to capture notice, let's say, and, and become active in those various societies, and then use those places, use those affiliations, use those appointments and those honors that I, that I uh, was awarded along the way as a basis for speaking out with authority. My um, speech on tropical biodiversity in 1985 in Chicago at the American Association for the Emancipation of Science was the first time that many people had ever thought of these problems, it turns out, because in those days they had few keynote lectures and there were very, you know, there were like a thousand people there. So it's very influential and the MacArthur Foundation published it and all. 
And we had developed a kind of a mafia of people who were pointing out that we were losing things far faster than we knew and we needed to do something about it. Um, Ed Wilson tells in the, in the book, in his, uh, pre in his autobiography, in his um, preface to the book that uh, when he wanted to become active in that area, he called me because I was one of the few people that were pushing it, but we pushed along and the, the evidence became clearer and clearer and uh, we spoke out, always begging for next generation people to fill in. And now we have them. But it's a late realization for people. And I was just in the right position, the head of a very active institution dealing with uh, Africa, China, and so forth. And being able to emerge as a leader in talking about the problems that we faced and what we might do about them. Well, one of the things that's, that's very interesting is that different countries have different uh, diversity resources um, and also have different ways of thinking about biodiversity. Um, I know that you've worked very hard on some international efforts to, to move biodiversity forward. Um, are there places where you think the, uh, a country is more advanced in preserving biodiversity than the U.S.? Um, and obviously, there are, I know that there's countries where there's other factors that, that don't put it at the forefront. Well, the trouble is countries like people are divided into rich and poor. Six people in the world have as much money as the 3.6 billion poorest people in the world. And it's unbalanced both between countries and inside countries and the the problem, as we noticed when the Convention on Biological Diversity was being formed, we had meetings in Nairobi to begin to work that up, were that you could convince the people in the poorer countries that conservation was a good thing, but how were they going to do it? Uh, I, it really struck me once we were looking at a proposal when I was on the grant-making committee in the National Geographic Society, and it was trying to convince people in, people in the West in a West African country to stop killing and eating gorillas and chimps. But if you were poor and your children were starving to death and there were gorillas and chimps around you, I think it would be hard for somebody to come in and say, we must save them for the, those inequalities have got to be addressed if we're going to do it more strongly. The convention on biological diversity is the strongest international agreement but uh, that's been made, but it was ratified about 27 years ago and about one quarter of all tropical forest has been destroyed since it was ratified. So one wonders, it looks like we're headed, unless we can get our act together on global warming, climate change, and the loss of biodiversity, we're headed for a loss of all those rich forests by the end of this century, which will be an enormous loss. But of course, it really emphasizes the usefulness, in fact, the, the necessity of activities like those the garden is carrying out around the world in studying and preserving those, those, uh, those plants and other organisms while they're there, a very difficult problem. But whatever is there depends on us. As one of our colleagues said wisely at one point, if you don't save it now, you won't be able to save it later. And I think that's the position we're in. In a very rich country like the United States, we do a pretty good internal job of conservation of our own resources. But if everybody had the level of money that we had in the United States, it would take four copies of the planet Earth to support us. So you see there's, a, there's kind of a real problem there. Another problem, of course, is disregarding and, and abusing the legitimate rights of women and children to act on their own futures and their own family futures in their own countries. We have far too many people in the world now for the world to support sustainably and people sort of erect fantastic schemes. But until people in different countries and different socioeconomic classes and so forth um, really get their act together and, um, begin to understand that love for everyone on this planet is necessary, that we all need to come together at some level if we want to be able to save the planet and if we want to avoid a huge collapse in the latter half of this century. 
And if we do, we deserve it. So those are um, dire, it's a dire warning. Um, and, and I think uh, many people are probably wondering right now um, as, as a final question, what can we do as individuals? In some sense, it seems as though given the magnitude of the issues that you've just spoken about, recycling and all of the things that we do as individuals, it's hard to imagine that that really helps. And so I wonder if, if you could just opine on that. Um, well, on the contrary, when you consider that uh, 10% of the countries that hold 10% of the people in the world uh, use 40% of the sustainable productivity, then you begin to realize that what we do in a rich country like the United States is far from being unimportant, is very important. We need to bring our consumption levels down to reasonable levels uh, where that the world can afford instead of being far beyond what the world can afford. And that'll mean a lot of reshuffling and avoiding meat and going to more vegetables and uh, using fossil fuels and not using fossil fuels, but using fuels that will not keep driving the world's temperature upward. Uh, and uh, we, and, we're so rich that when we do act on those areas, it's very important. But on the other hand, we're traditionally so greedy that we can't do it because we say, well, we want more in the United States. You know, we're not well off, but we're thinking about basically the post-World War II period when we controlled almost the entire world economy and could entirely have our way. Well, we'll never have our way like that again, but we can be a huge influence we need to honor and respect other people. We need to honor and respect women and develop their rights in our countries and all around the world. A very serious obstacle. There are at least a billion women in the world out of 8 billion uh, total people who have no, no rights at all, no ability to express themselves. And we can work towards internationalism and we can work towards creating uh, connections between countries for ourselves and for our children. And as we understand that, maybe usefully using moral precepts, such as in religions and similar systems of thought, we can learn to love and regard one another as important. And we can learn to manage the whole in a way that will, will not crash, but we're on a very dangerous edge. There's no doubt about that. And, just simply pretending it's going to go away or it's better to get on with the soccer game for tomorrow than it is to think about this. That's totally wrong if you care at all about those who come later and if you want them to enjoy anything like the privileges that we enjoy now. Um, that, that it's really interesting, particularly the way that you weave in issues, um, general social issues such as women's rights um, with, with the the connections to the environment and to sustainability. So at this point, we are about ready to um, have some questions from, um, from the audience. And then at the very end, um, I, it would be great if you could just give some final remarks. But at this point, um, here's a very interesting question. A lot of folks wonder why does the garden have so much space that you just store dry plants and why do we have a herbarium and what is the value of a herbarium? Well, the value of a herbarium over the years is to give actual physical material of the plant so you can compare it to another physical specimen of the plant and see how many different items there are out there. But now we're at a time when scientists generally predict that about 20%, about one out of every five species will is likely to go extinct in the next 30 years and 40% <clears throat> or even more by the end of the century. And that means that many, much of the material that we have in herbaria is the only material that we'll ever have, that we'll ever be able to study or anything else. So it's as if we're given the last opportunity to preserve samples of those specimens. Hopefully we would preserve them alive, which we also try to do, but samples of those species that people will ever be able to study, that they'll ever be able to understand what the world was like at its richest level ever in biodiversity, a very important thing to accomplish. Um, and, and by the way, the garden uh, grow, having grown from 2 million to about 7 million specimens is one of the say 10 largest in the world. It's a very important depository now 
as our work has spread over all of Latin America, as our work has spread in Africa and particularly in Madagascar, and as our work has spread in China, we've grown rapidly and are now a much more valuable international asset than we were, uh, say, uh, 60, 70 years ago. Yeah, and I think an important point that as, um, as, as plants become extinct, it's the only, um, it's the only way that, um, that we're going to really know what they look like um, and, and actually have biological material, which can be, um, be extraordinarily useful. Yeah, the, the, the molecules, the, the macromolecules yeah. that you, would, you analyze to look at comparisons are still there, depending on how they've been preserved. So here's a great question. What was the most fascinating or vexing project you worked on? Maybe besides the um, uh, Japanese garden, because we've heard a lot about that. Well, um, <clears throat> two of the, uh, well, <laughs> lots. <laughs> we, we, we started something here. I wanted to do something called Flora Mesoamericana, which is eventually called that which would be a unified account of all the plants between Southern Mexico and Panama, all of Central America and uh, Southern Mexico. And I started that and I called together the people who were working on individual floras, individual accounts of countries in that area and said, let's do this, it's great. And they all said, pooey, uh, no. But I kept going. It was particularly difficult to get the uh, Mexicans to sort of regard the southern part of their territory, even in a scholarly work, as part of Central America. But I had friends in Mexico because of our extensive work in the southernmost Mexican state of Chiapas while I was at Stanford. I was able to get good advice and we were able to start the flora. But that was some uh, probably 12 years after I began trying to start it. Another just good one, which I'll say briefly, is the flora of China. When China began to open up, many of us wanted to do, in fact, the Chinese wanted to do a revised flora of China in English because as they had written accounts of their own plants behind the bamboo curtain of all those years, they didn't have access to worldwide information that was available in the old capitals where the stuff used to be studied. And I, I think I spent 10 years and probably 40 trips to China meetings and things, you know, to get to the point where the Chinese Academy of Sciences finally accepted that idea, which was uh, another, they're both very, very, but that gives you an idea of the kind of thing that I've worked hard to get going. Well, and that's on the scientific um, uh, portfolio. What about in terms of a project um, in, in St. Louis at the Missouri Botanical Garden? Well, um, the the zoo museum just getting creating the new botanic garden subdistrict was the hardest. I mean, that took like four years to get there. We once envisioned uh, build building the area all the way up to the freeway into a parking lot from the garden. I worked on that and then it was smashed down. Yeah. Yeah, but um, any project in the city of St. Louis is vexing. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah. So um, here, here's an interesting question. Um, if you were asked to do a reading of just one, just one chapter or story from your book, what would it be? Of course, you should read the whole book. But if somebody, what, what would you suggest yeah. as number one? Um, if you have kids or you're interested in kids or how to get them going uh, in this area in biology, then, then uh, the, like, I think it's ch about chapter three, about when I was at uh, childhood interest in how it grew and why it grew would be very important. If not, I have an epilogue in the book, which is an overall view of the world as I see it now, uh, after all these years of puzzling about it. And I think that would probably be the one. Um, here's a, another question um, in a similar vein. What's your favorite spot in the garden? And um, has that changed over time? So you have a favorite spot now. What were some of the earlier ones as well? Ah. Earlier ones probably were the development um, of the um, gardens in front of the Linnean house uh, and uh, right along in front of the Linnean house and around the Climatron. They 
they were very interesting and wonderful to get going. And of course, the Japanese garden as a whole. But if, but now, if you say my favorite spot in the garden, I would say it's the the pool at the head of the stream running into the Japanese garden from the uh, east, which is a great. Um, sorry, from the west, which is a great. Uh, area of woods and flowers and so forth and uh, something that where you can sit quietly and be delighted with the peace and the solitude and all for a long time. John Elsley, who worked here then, created the idea of building a English woodland garden and I think that's been a huge success in terms of quiet, peaceful and wonderful place to be. I would certainly agree with that. So we have a historical question. Why is it the Missouri Botanical Garden and not the, is it the Missouri Botanical Garden and not the St. Louis Botanical Garden? Oh, that's easy. <laughs> that was simply Henry Shaw's name for it. We could change the name, but it's so well ingrained now that I don't think we would want to. Now Shaw's Garden informally is, is what people call it. And that's fine. If, if something has an informal name, that means people really love it. And by golly, the people of St. Louis really love this garden. And if I can say one thing about my time here, it's how much I enjoyed basking in that love. And willingness to develop good things for themselves and their children in the world, being very proud of them and wanting to keep them up. So, um, at this point, we have just a, a couple of minutes, and I wanted to turn it over to you for um, any final words. Well, it's hard to beat the love of St. Louis. <laughs> well, it's interesting that my life, you know, started at a time I was born in 36 and uh, grew up in San Francisco. And then it was a matter of assuming pretty much that everything that was there would still be there. In the middle part of my life, I from 35 on, I, I began... Uh, looking at plants all around the world, which was a big step for me, you know, broadening that much and doing it. And then eventually, as the absolute need for conservation grew, uh, that became dominant. The number of people in the world has uh, more than tripled during my life. And to think that there are three mouths to feed for every mouth that there was then, and to think that the number of people in the mid-30s say two and a half, three billion possibly could, could be sustained, could be sustainable. Uh, the very thought of that and then just racing through that to the uh, difficult situation that we're facing now makes me, uh, of course, be very concerned. But if you turn that around, then what I've talked about is the love and concern for one another and just look at the efforts people in St. Louis make to do good things. We always seem to want to emphasize the bad, but we do so many good things here that if we would emphasize them, I think we would be a little more peaceful and a little more active uh, in our efforts to make this place a better and better place to live. As far as I'm concerned, it's a great place to live now, filled with great and generous people. And I couldn't have enjoyed anything more than spending 50 years of my life here in their company and with their support, which I've tried to return. Well, um, I, I think the, the love is mutual um, from, a, from a member. Thank you, Dr. Raven, for a lifetime of contributions to our garden. And I think all of us feel incredibly grateful. Thank you. Thank you. I feel incredibly grateful too.